Okay, this is the fourth Mana Machine alert we've done on the Mount Ebel Curse Amulet. On Thursday, the peer-reviewed publication finally dropped, and it's a doozy. On this episode of Ancient Egypt and the Bible. This last Thursday, the article by Scott Stripling, Peter Gert Vanderveen, and Gershon Galil, plus the lab techs from the Institute of Theoretical and Applied Mechanics of the Czech Academy of Sciences, published their findings on the Mount Ebel Amulet. The article is entitled, quote, You are cursed by the god Yahu, end quote, an early Hebrew inscription from Mount Ebel, and it was published in the journal Heritage Science. I'm here again with my producer, Kiara, who we're, we're going to discuss this article that just came out talking about the now famous Mount Ebel curse tablet. So at this point, I'm going to swing over and we'll get this discussion going. Okay, here we are. I think the first thing we need to do is discuss a little background of this discovery for those who aren't familiar with it. And on the top of it, on the surface, this sounds like a really fascinating discovery. It sounds like a revolutionary find. So that must make us sit back and say, okay, it sounds too good to be true. It sounds too good to we be true. We so want this to be true. We so want this to be true. So, when was this first found? Okay. We have to sort of... I think we need to sort of do a little background of where this is coming from, okay? In the 1980s, Adam Zertel excavated the site of Mount Ebel. Now, for those who aren't familiar with Mount Ebel, this is the area where Joshua divided the people into a mountain of blessings and a mountain of curses. One is Mount Gerizim, the other is Mount Ebel. And they were to build an altar on Mount Ebel and pledge curses upon themselves in the event that they disobeyed God's laws. Okay? So that's sort of the historical background of the site. You're kind of not taught that in Sunday school, are you? No, you're not. <laughs> a lot you're not taught in Sunday school. <laughs> okay, we all hear about the mountain of blessing. Yeah, you're not so much hearing about the mountain cursing. Okay, that's interesting in and of itself. It is very interesting of itself. Now, when Zertel excavated this site, he was short of cash. He was very short of cash. It wasn't a fully funded dig. So he hooked up with the associates for Biblical Research, also known as ABR. Now, who ABR is, is there a sort of a, an evangelistic missionary organization that tries to show the Bible is the Word of God through archaeology. But they also have a particular ideological bent. They believe in a very literalistic reading of genealogies. They believe in the early Exodus date. They'll go, they'll die on that hill. That's a hill that they think is worth dying on. So anyway, they get involved in a lot of digs because they're very well funded. Yes. Okay. And their volunteers will pay money to an archaeological dig for the privilege of digging. So Zertel had this kind of deal with the devil where he was using ABR volunteers, taking ABR money to fund his dig. Well, when the publication started coming out on the Mount Ebel dig, Zertel dated the site to the Late Bronze II B, Early Iron Age period. This was not something ABR was very happy about. Because if Joshua set up his altar at the time of, say, 1200 B.C., or a little, a little after, 
that conflicts with their ideology of an early Exodus date, which they think Joshua made his conquest in 1406 BC. So how does a finding for the 1200s fit with the late, late daters? Yeah, with a late Exodus date, it's, it's fine. It's, it's exactly what we would expect. Okay? For a late Exodus date, those findings are exactly what we would expect from the Mount Ebel site. So ABR was not happy. ABR was really unhappy about this. Okay. So what happened? And, and they had been quite public about uh, attacking Zertel's findings. Now, after Zertel's death in October 2015, ABR went back to Mount Ebel to do the wet sifting project, basically going through the fill, basically the discarded debris that Zertel dug up, and they put it through wet sifting to try to find more stuff, essentially to try to change the Zertel's dating. And while wet sifting is a very valid means mm -hmm. of, of finding artifacts, you're supposed to do the sifting, see what you find, and then come up with your conclusion. Yeah, so they had already arrived with their conclusions in mind. But what happened was, they, in this wet sifting project, they discovered a small lead amulet that was about two centimeters by two centimeters um, on December 2019. And for our American nurse, two centimeters is a little less than an inch. Yeah, I think I read it's like 0.8 of an inch. Yeah, it's like 0.8 of an inch. So this, we're talking a very tiny, tiny little amulet. Yes. Now, they couldn't just open up the lead tablet because it's too brittle. It would have fallen apart. So they needed a way to scan through the tablet to read it on the inside without opening it. And they had, in the end of 2021, sent that out to a Czechoslovakian lab to try to decipher what's on the inside. And in March 2022, Scott Stripling and a team consisting of himself, Peter Vanderveen, and Gershon Galil announced at a press conference that they had deciphered the am amulet, then the results would then be published in a peer-reviewed journal by summer 2022. Well, it's now spring 2023, and we finally got the publication here, and that's what we're going to discuss. So that sort of covers the background of the history leading up to this. Now, we've been giving updates on this every so often for various little news bits and advances that we've heard along the way, but this is the final publication. So we can see from this that this site is a winner-take-all proposition for ABR. If, if ABR can prove that this site dates to 1406, they win the whole enchilada. If it comes out that this site dates to 1220 or later, they lose it all. A very high stakes. Very high stakes. Yeah, this is a winner-take-all proposition for ABR. And we have to understand how much influence ABR has here. They funded the Weft Sifting Project. They funded much of the original dig. And they funded the publication of a lot of the background that was done to research this article. So they've got a huge vested interest in all of this. Doesn't that conflict... Then, with the uh, standard statement at the end of the article, well, that, I mean, they can probably make that almost every article has to state if you have a conflict of interest or not. Well, those conflicts of interest statements, we have to kind of understand, are... Are supposed to be for this very reason. Are very vague. Yes. Okay. It's... I think it's I worded... I mean, really, it's basically really... A proprietary financial interest yes but the whole idea behind authors stating if they have a financial investment mm -hmm. if they are attached to the people funding it 
yeah. is to give you, to give people like me, the, the general reader, yeah. an idea of how do you track the money. Yeah. Well, there is money flowing on this one. Uh, there is no doubt that this is going to increase donations to both ABR and to the Bible Seminary, which is ABR School. And I read in the article that um, Dr. Stripling identified himself as the vice president of donor relations. Yes. So this is playing a part in his role it, because obviously if this comes out in their favor, donor relations are going to go through the roof in a positive manner for them. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Just so that's established at the beginning. Yeah. So yeah, that's that's gonna be a that's gonna be a big issue in all this. Okay. Okay. Because if as I say, if they lose this one, they're gonna take a hit to their donations. They're gonna take a lot of hits. Their the legitimacy of their position is gone. And of course, our position on that, when you're a facts based archaeologist, when you're a facts based theologian. Mm-hmm. You simply come out and say, well, there's new evidence. This is exciting. Mm -hmm. We still have an historically valid Bible. Okay, so uh, we need to sort of discuss who are the principal authors of this article. There's, we do have a few lab texts, again, from that uh, Czech Institute. But they're not really contributing anything more than their technical expertise to the x-ray tomography. But the three sort of guys who are doing the archaeology and the epigraphy here are Scott Stripling, Peter Gert, Vanderveen, and Gershon Galil. Okay? Now, Scott Stripling is a big wig at ABR. Okay? He's a one of their one of their top guys. He initially held a doctor of ministry and church leadership, but became an accomplished field archaeologist for ABR. He then earned a PhD in archaeology from Veritas International uh, University. Now, what's interesting about this was who his Dr. Vodder was, which is Steve Collins, the, the head of the excavation at Tel El Haman. So... I would we're going to put up a card here for that video which we did on Tel El Haman and all the hinkiness that's around that. So he comes by his hinkiness legitimately, <laughs> if you can call it that, <laughs> legitimate. <laughs> uh, as you already mentioned, he's provost and VP of donor relations at the Bible Seminary in Katy, Texas. Now, for those who aren't familiar with the Bible Seminary, it's ABR school. It's ABR seminary. So what kind of degrees do they have? Masters. And we should note that Stripling has used a lot of the press of this discovery to promote both ABR and the Bible Seminary. So he has a quote, archaeological institute within the Bible Seminary, which is quite incredible given that it has less than 30 students. Wow. Yeah. So, yeah, it's got about, just, about as many part time instructors as it has students. Sweet deal. <laughs> yeah. Uh, we should also note, though, as an associate at ABR, Stripling holds to an early Exodus date and that Amenhotep II was the pharaoh of the Exodus. And he's very rigid. Yeah, very rigid. This is, this is standard fare for ABR. Now, it gets interesting with the next author, which is Peter Gert van der Veen. Now, he is a Syro-Palestinian archaeologist. That means his area of specialty is Levantine studies. He is a lecturer at the Johannes Gutenberg Universität Mainz. 
He is best known for his paper on the Berlin pedestal, uh, supporting the view of Manfred Gorg. Now, in that article, he argued that this pedestal had an early toponym of Israel that dated to the time of Amenhotep II. Now, that has been since been challenged. Those findings have been challenged most recently by Robert Rittner, who is very, very well known in the Egyptological circles and just recently passed away. Now, Vanderveen is also an early dater, or also an early Exodus dater. But he's a different kind of early dater than what you find at ABR. He was involved with David Roll's Society of Interdisciplinary Studies workshop. Now, I'm not familiar with that. Could you? Yes, we'll expound. talk about that. Now, David Roll is best known for his new chronology, which is a deeply flawed hypothesis that basically tries to compress the chronology down by hundreds of years. Now, the problem is it's completely defective. It's a completely defective chronology. It's internally con inconsistent at at least 40 places. 40? 40. Wow. Oh. So this, this is, it's an impossible chronology. It's impossible. But what Rule did was he started this symposium. It's really a symposium. And he called it the Society of, International, or of Interdisciplinary Studies Workshop. And what he would do is he would enlist junior and young up-and-coming academics to give papers and potentially to be published as part of this symposium. This was a way he ingratiated himself to basically rising stars in the field. So a lot of scholars went easy on David Roll because they had been given an early leg up in life. Ah. Oh, good old boy network. He, well, sort of, but... Not really a good old boy network, but basically, Roll gives you a favor, you, you return it. You softball what comes in. You softball what comes in. I mean, this is one of the reasons why Michael Heiser was largely sympathetic to David Roll for most of his life. Because he was part of this workshop. Oh. Yeah. And so was Peter Gert Vanderveen. Unlike your professors who actually critique your work and you critique theirs. Mm hmm Honestly, openly, and in an academic manner. Yes. So this is this is how he has been able to sort of get along. Now, Vanderveen is, unlike Heiser, who, is, who never, Heiser was sort of skeptical of David Roll, but did it in a very, not an open way, okay? In fact, he would vacillate, okay? He would vacillate. Uh, Heiser some days would say, well, maybe there's not a lot of evidence for his chronology too. Well, we, we need to really listen to David Roll. Unlike, unlike Heiser, Vanderveen has fully embraced the chronology of David Roll. So he's a Roll advocate. So this is very problematic. So we got here, just in this first two authors, two different perspectives on the early date cooperating together, but holding fast to that point of view. So that covers Stripling and Vanderveen. The third one, uh, Gershon Galil. We're dealing with something very different here than we do with Stripling or Vanderveen. Uh, Galil is a professor of biblical studies and ancient history at the University of Haifa. So he's high up in the career. But his career has been less than a success, even though he managed to become a full professor. 
Now, how's that possible? Um, question. Yes. Is it less than a success or merely not sensational? Because well, we know a lot of professors mm -hmm. who have had excellent, solid careers, but they just don't get well known outside uh, the university. Well, okay. Well, let's go a little over his career, because that might illuminate this. Okay. His PhD dissertation was entitled The Chronology of the Kings of Israel and of Judah. Now, this dissertation presented a new chronology that contrasted Albright and Teeley. The problem is his views never got traction. So, not a stellar start. However, he was a very, very good excavator. And he became Yigal Yadin's right-hand man. And Yadin was a giant in the field. He was a giant in the field. He excavated at Hatsor. Oh. Okay. So, really, really, Yadin was a really, really big name. But Galil sort of lived in his shadow. And what happened was, after Yadin's death, Galil found himself without a seat at the table. So he was in a no-man's land. He no longer could ride on Yadin's coattails, but his research wasn't as innovative or penetrating as, say, others in the field. So... In hooking up with ABR to do this article, this is Leal's last attempt at significance in this field. That's a lot. It is a lot to have writing on what you find. Uh, ABR smelled blood in the water and preyed upon Leal. It was... Yeah. They were looking for somebody who had some gravitas who could add legitimacy to this article that neither Stripling nor Vanderveen could. Because both basically the ideas of Stripling and Vanderveen are kind of on the fringe. They're on the periphery of the field. Well, their bias towards their organizations or towards role yeah. is just so obvious. Yeah. So they needed somebody outside of that. Yeah. And to be honest, Vanderveen is really the highest academic to support Roll's work. Nobody else does. Well. There's a reason. I've met Roll personally and heard him personally, so there's a reason for that. <laughs> 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 I love reading his books. I love reading his books. They're very interesting. He's got a great writing style. I mean, he's got the whole shtick with the bow tie, and he's got this whole persona. He's... um he knows how to present himself very well. He markets himself very well. He's got a brand. And uh, you can, it's really easy to buy into that brand. But there's problems. And uh, David helped me reading the first book, pointing out how many times he changed the date of what he was saying in just his own book, in one book. He changes dates to fit whatever part of the story he's telling at that point. So, uh, great read, enjoyable to listen to, but a few problems if you are knowledgeable enough to track the argument. There's some problems with the argument. So yeah, Galil was there to give legitimacy that the other two authors couldn't. Because he is a well-known academic. He's, I mean, he's had his problems. He's had his problems, but he is a well-known academic. And he is a professor at Haifa. So that goes a long ways. And he's an expert in this field. So what happened? It looks like he lost his touch. We'll get into exactly how as we get into this. Plus, there would have been a lot of... Just like you said, with the original digger of this who accepted ABR's money. There was pressure on the original digger to come up with the expected answers. 
I mean, we all know anybody who pays you money wants what they want for their money. Very few people actually support true research, which is you go in, you find the evidence, then you draw your conclusion. Correct. Well, we should also talk about the publication. Now, early on, I was wondering what kind of publication they could possibly get this result. And I, I made some suggestions that, you know, hey, maybe they'll, they'll use their own publication like the NAS Journal. For those who don't know, the Near Eastern Archaeology Society, the NAS, is, was once upon a time a legitimate archaeological, evangelical archaeological society that has been since taken over by ABR. So basically, ABR drove out all the more moderate evangelicals. But I had, I had thought that they might have published it in NES. Logical assumption. It's a logical assumption. Or find a, basically, a journal, a low-level journal. Uh, what they did was very interesting, though. Now, the fact that this had come out in this particular journal is, is very, very telling on its own. The journal they finally did publish in was Heritage Science. Now, what is Heritage Science? It is an open source, peer reviewed science journal. It's not a journal for the ancient Near East. Nor is it a journal generally on archaeology. No. So, did they get in the back door because of the science and technology used? To do the x-ray tomography? They might have. But I think there's more going on here. Okay? I, I do think that this was not their first choice in journal. I think this was a journal of last resort. This was their last resort before considering publishing in the NES. Self-publishing. Yeah. And, and everyone, if, if they had published in the journal of, NA, of the NAS... It everyone would have, been, would have shrugged and said, well, yeah, that figure. Yeah, everyone would have shrugged and said, yeah, that's a self-publishing publication. So this is a legitimate publication, but just a questionable subject for them to be publishing. It's like publishing this article in a journal of proctology. <laughs> okay, that's an image. Thank you. I mean, really, uh -huh. it, it's, it's on that level. This is the sort of uh, a journal that publishes stuff on, say, environmental science, water tables, chemistry of, of say, cooking fires. Or my interest. Base, basically, it, basically, it is a science journal. Sounds like a it's cool journal. It's not an archaeology journal. But odd choice to publish it's an incredibly odd choice to publish in and everybody has been waiting for the peer-reviewed article on this subject to come out mm -hmm. yeah so it's a dodgy choice a really dodgy choice and really what it sounds like to me is it got rejected by several other editors first basically the way the peer review process works is it first has to pass through the editor if the editor thinks it's worth publishing, then he passes, passes it on to peer reviewers. And the peer reviewers will make the determination whether or not it's worth publishing. And if you have good peer reviewers, mm -hmm. they're brutal. They are brutal. Now, this is where the rub comes in. When you publish in a journal like this, a lot of who serves as peer reviewers is who the editor knows. So the question is, what kind of peer reviewers would Heritage Science know? Probably not anything related to the ancient Near East. They would be guys, as I say, guys like chemists, environmental scientists, geologists. So you might have somebody who could actually speak to the science of tomography, mm -hmm. but that's not what this article is about. No, it isn't. But you would also, then the problem comes in with when you use a basically far afield journal like this, is the editor is not always a good judge of who's a good peer reviewer, who's 
has standing in the field. They're just finding someone who will fit the bill. We're seeing that with more and more journals that they're getting very circular. Yeah. So if I'm hearing you correctly, you're implying that a small circle was brought in to peer. Yes, a small circle was brought in. We don't know the quality of those peer reviewers. And what we do know is the people you know who are experienced mm -hmm. epigraphers in this field were not contacted. Yeah, the ones I know in the field were not asked. Yeah. So uh, Stripling does state there was a small number of people qualified to do this, and the journal really struggled. And he's implying because there's so few people qualified, and yet you can name a handful, mm -hmm. and none of them were contacted. Yeah, none of them were contacted. So I think, I think that's an issue here, that the people in the field were who are actually experts at this, were never contacted. So that makes me ask, I mean, uh, granted, there are more epigraphers in, say, the, in the field of the ancient Near Eastern studies than there are, say, chronologists. Okay. True. I mean, chronologists are really rare. Epigraphers are still pretty uncommon. There's not that many of them. But, but there are more than three. There are more than three, yes. So, but again, too, if you got contacted by Heritage's Science asking to peer review this, you would, you might be, you might be asking yourself, do I really want to do this? Am I really, f like, for example, I was once contacted by a chemistry journal to be a peer reviewer. I'm not a chemist. No, I ironically, you know a lot more about chemistry than a lot of people since you started out as a biochem major in your undergrad, but. But it's suffice it to say that I, I turned it down because it's, it's just not my field. You know, I am very into, I do peer review work. I mean, I, I, I've done it several times and it's just like, okay, I want to make sure that whatever I peer review is going to be in my wheelhouse. And if it's not in my wheelhouse, I am going to say no. Yeah, but we, we do know from people we know personally, we have some kind of personal contact with. Yeah. There are several people in the field of ancient Near East epigraphy who were not contacted. Yes. yes that's we correct. don't know who the peer review. Yeah, we don't people, know who the peer reviewers are. But we know who were not contacted yeah. to be considered. I know some of the top names weren't contacted. Okay. And you would think on a find, Stripling is purporting this to be an earth-shattering find. Yeah. Um, you would think you would get the very top people first. Yeah. And publish in the very top article. Yeah. You would want an article like this. If this article is really as important as all this, you would want it in at, I mean, if it's controversial, maybe a second tier ancient Near Eastern journal. They, they do exist. You know, you might not be able to get into a top tier, but you certainly should be able to get into a second tier one. Or even a third tier. Well, you know, second, third tiers. <laughs> I know, but the fact that this was not an ancient Near Eastern journal at all. The longer we're talking, the more questionable this is sounding to me. Well, it should. It should sound questionable. So I, I think that's that's a very important concern here is that they did seem to take a peer re, peer reviewed journal of last resort. Perfectly respectable journal for its wheelhouse. Hey, if you're if you're doing environmental chemistry, publishing this this is a great journal for that. Now I want to read the journal. <laughs> <laughs> it's open access, so you can. Cool. Yeah, it's an open access journal. Cool. So yes, absolutely, you can read this journal online. Okay, uh, we should now get into to Stripling and Company's actual argument here. Now... Uh, everyone is focused here, when we talk about the article here, now, the article is 24 pages. It's a long article. It's 
it's Stripling's argument, and I've heard it now. He gave the argument at the NES conference. Yes, they didn't want to know I was there listening. Sorry, ABR. <laughs> heard the whole thing. <laughs> <laughs> uh, they Stripling's argument is basically a two-prong argument and people go right to the epigraphy on this one and I think it's important to take a step back because again the winner-take-all proposition here is going to really matter with how Stripling approaches this argument and how he how he tries to use that to confirm his later epigraphic dating. And it's, as I said, two-prong argument. Now, the first prong of the argument is that he redates Zertel's typology. Define for our viewers what you mean by that. Okay. A ceramic typology is pottery. Ceramics are pottery. And the thing with pottery is it's datable. So you can arrange it in... A chronological order and that's called a typology you find the type of pottery and you can date it by the type and this is a field a lot of people go into yeah um i've been to so many conferences with david and there's all these people who are so excited about you know it's a different shaped pot it's not something i've gotten excited about yeah i don't get excited about it either but it is a necessary part and a fairly crucial part, correct? Mm -hmm. Of dating a site. Oh yeah, definitely. Uh, ceramic topology is invaluable. And because so many people have gotten into the field, from what I've gathered, it's advanced a long way to become very reliable. Yes, it's very reliable. We are gonna get into the argument here, especially we're gonna start with this uh, the, the section here on the ceramic topology, and that's on page three of his article. Now, at his presentation at the NAAS, he did a lot on ceramic topology. I got a glimpse of an early version of this article, too, and I noticed he cut this down dramatically. Okay. So I think the peer reviewers had a problem with it. Ah. Okay. But I'm going to read this section here from page three, and then we're going to go through this section because I think it's really important. Okay? He says, um, a first full paragraph, the overwhelming majority, 97% of the pottery dated to Iron Age 1, circa 1200 to 1150 BCE, and the rest, 3%, dated to Late Bronze 2B circa 1250 to 1200 BCE. However, Levitt provides three examples of late Bronze Age pottery from Stratum II being older than Zertel proposed. First, the open carinated bowl disappears by late Bronze II B. Yet, Zertel published such a bowl. Second, Zertel's cited parallels for two chalice fragments were in his estimation, contemporary with the open carinated bowl, which did not exist in late Bronze II B period. Third, a diagnostic crater shard for which Zertel record no parallel mirrors a shard from Lachish, which dates to the late Bronze 1 B to A horizon. Okay. Now... Now, the let's layperson's talk eyes... About, let's talk about this here, because... The layperson's eyes are rolling back in our heads going, yeah. what? Yep, so we are going to take this piece by piece. Okay, even though it's just one paragraph, it's important to really tease this one out. My guess is, as with most of these things that we deal with, they are relying on the average person not being able to interpret what they say. Yes. So you are now going to interpret this. We are going to interpret this. Excellent. So, because I think it's really, really important. Okay. 
Now, uh, that first statement here, the overwhelming majority, 97% of the pottery dated to Iron Age 1A, circa 1200 to 1150 BC, and the rest 3% dated to the Late Bronze Age 2B, circa 1250 to 1200 BCE, end quote. Okay. Now, Stripling identifies three fragments from Mount Ebel that he claimed were earlier than Late Bronze 2B. Three out of 10,000. I'm biting back saying, seriously, dude? Yeah, seriously, dude. But it gets worse. Okay. His next quote here. Quote, however, Levitt provides three examples of Late Bronze Age pottery from Stratum 2 being older than Zertel proposed, end quote. Now, who is Levitt? This is not some giant in the field. This is, according to uh, ABR's site, this is Ms. Abigail Levitt. She is an associate at ABR. Ah, uh, mm -hmm. that's not the authority that's presented. No, it isn't. She is a dig director for ABR at Shiloh. She is essentially a shell for ABR. She's also a student at the Bible Seminary. So she's not a ceramics expert. She's not an expert in the field. And again, we're not saying no student cannot be particularly good in what they do. Yeah, we're not saying that at all. Um, we're just saying... But for an article this important... They should have gone outside their inner circle. Yeah. And gotten actual established. Yeah. Uh, uh, people have been waiting for this. People have been wanting to get in on this. People have saying, you know, let us see what you found. So they're not lacking for experts willing to examine. This is sloppy. This is sloppy. To quote a non-expert as an expert who is in your own organization, yeah, it, it screams um, sloppiness. This is the best you could come up with, okay? But, okay, it's not really the best they come up, but the fact that they use this is I'm, I think what they're doing is they're trying to give her credit for identifying these shards. They're trying to make her an expert they're trying using to, this article. Yes. Basically, they're, they're, they're ceramic typologist. Their ceramics expert at ABR is Bryant Wood. He's retired. They need a new ceramics expert to replace him. Somebody who could... Uh, Jigger this. There is a reason universities used to have a hiring policy that you're not allowed to hire your own PhDs. Mm -hmm. The idea was you hire your master's degree students who went out, got a PhD from somebody else, actually got verified as an actual competent expert by a completely different yeah. From what I understand, she is pursuing a PhD at Ariel University, but she has not achieved it yet. The, the, that's, that's neither here nor there. The fact is, there is a conflict of interest. This is not some objective scholar here. This is somebody within ABR's own ranks. Who is hoping to fill a top position. Now, you could have probably said in a footnote that, you know, these, these three were... were were discovered by her okay but to sort of leave it kind of up in the open that this is a uh seems to be an expert call uh it's it's dicey questionable it's, it's, it's questionable it's questionable doesn't automatically mean it's inaccurate but it's certainly questionable practice and surprise surprise levitt disagrees with Zertel. i didn't see that coming <laughs> But it gets worse. This doesn't get better. Is the next statement here says, quote, the first 
First, the open carinated bowl disappears by late bronze to be yet Sertel published the bowl. And they have a footnote here to Mullins, which Stripling cites. But the actual citation says something very different. It says, and I quote Mullins here, by the late bronze to be, the carinated bowl is extremely rare in both the North and the South. By the Iron 1B, it is replaced by the SEMA or S-shaped bowl. Extremely rare is not disappeared. This means it's still extant in 2B. Just not common. Fair enough. Okay. So that's misquoting. He misquotes Mullins here. Then... Quote, second, Zertel cited parallels for two chalice fragments were, in his esp estimation, contemporary with the open carinated bowl, which did not exist in late bronze 2B period, end quote. Okay, and here's what Zertel said. The carinated bowl, which came from the fill of the main structure, was found in abundance at Hatsor uh, 13, uh, Megiddo 8, 7B, and 7. These are stratigraphic layers. Tel uh, Marak uh, 10. The type is well dated to the second half of the Late Bronze Age. End quote. That's Late Bronze 2B. So what Zertel said is consistent with Mullins. And... It's Stripling here that's out of step with the research. He's quoting Mullins against Sertel, and yet... Sertel is agreeing with Mullins. And, and Mullins in is reverse, saying the opposite of what Stripling is saying. Yeah. Now, the third quote here. Quote, Third, a diagnostic crater shard for which Sertel recorded no parallel mirrors a shard from Lachish which dates to the late Bronze Age, 1B to A horizon, end quote. Now, Zertel says that, quote, unique vessel is the bowl crater with the inverted ledge rim. No exact parallels could be found so far, end quote. This means that there are no parallels. Yeah, there are parallels, but no exact ones. And Mullins and Yanani say that large bowls, alternatively defined as craters, have a variety of rim forms. The rim may be slightly thickened on the interior, slightly outturned, or externally or internally profiled. And he says... In the late bronze 2b, the number of small deep bowls increases. Large deep bowls are wider and less delicate, often with diagonally everted or internally profiled rims. So this is for the late bronze 2b Iron Age 1. So... They also say inverted ledge bowls existed in the late bronze 2B. More contradictory evidence. More contradictory evidence. So, with that said, Scott Stripling does not have any ceramic topology that supports an early date uh, dating using ceramics. So he can't make that case that these pot shards are exclusive to late bronze one. And it's fourteen oh six. Zertel was quite certain in his dating. Yeah, Zertel was quite certain in his dating. The other thing he Scott does is he tries to overcome Randall's uh, ceramic or sorry, um, scarab typology. And he says something here that's also quite disingenuous. It's also on page three. The glyptic finds consisted of two scarabs and a die or seal. Baruch Brandel assigned scarab one to Ramses II, but Daphne Ventor and Peter Vanderveen, same guy, 
assign it to the reign of Tutmosis the third or soon after. Yeah, well. <laughs> Scarab 2 not only bears Tutmosis the third's cartouche, but also displays a seated bowman and gecko motifs most common during the 18th dynasty. Common, but not exclusive. Randall, however, interpreted the scarab as commemorative without providing supporting reasons, and that's not true. He did. His interpretation of scarab 2 therefore remains uncertain. Here's what he did. He used scarab typology. You can date a scarab by its typology, by its shape. There's two ways to date a scarab. You know, one gives you a, a terminus... A date basically going forward. And for example, if a name of a king shows up on a scarab, you can say, okay, this can be no earlier than, say, Tutmosis III. Because clearly Tutmosis III had to exist. Yeah. But that's not the only, when you get a scarab, that's not, you're not supposed to end there. Because we do know that there are commemorative scarabs. People carried them as good luck charms especially of great and conquering kings. We find them for Tutmosis III. We find them for Amenhotep III, and we find them for Ramses II. So you have to go do one more step, which is, is look at the topology of the scarab. Essentially, every era of scarab has a distinct shape and profile. And this Tutmosis III scarab fits the 19th dynasty. The shape and profile. Shape and profile. And that's is what, what Brandle is telling us in his article. So he's not giving no reason. He's just not giving a reason that Stripling either accepts or understands. So, but again, this is a winner-take-all proposition. So, of course, Vanderveen is going to double down on that Tutmosis III scare being to the reign of Tutmosis III, rather than look at the topology. You know, every, every Egyptologist knows this. You don't just look at the inscription on the scarab. You look at the topology as well. I mean, it's like having a commemorative coffee cup that you carry around you and mm -hmm. give on to your grandkids. Yeah. I yeah. mean, King Charles just got at his coronation, mm -hmm. and yet people still have, you know, commemorative coffee cups from his wedding to Diana. Well, those tins of Prince Albert in a can. Were made long after the death of Prince Albert. True. <laughs> okay. <laughs> I'm a little more familiar with coffee cups. <laughs> <laughs> Tobacco not your thing, huh? <laughs> nope. <laughs> okay, so that covers, say, the prong one of the argument. There's no basis for him to date this site earlier than other than people to be. who came in working with him in his inner circle. Yeah. Yeah, he does have to depend heavily on people in his inner circle and misquote his sources. Bad scholarship there. Yeah, bad scholarship right there. I mean, he does misquote Mullins. He badly misquotes Mullins. So that's a, that's a problem. That's a big problem. Now, let's get to the second prong, which is the epigraphy. After. <laughs> oh goodness. Oh, this is bad. What we're gonna do is we're gonna put a picture of Galil's epigraphy up on the screen here. For them to watch as we to watch to, to watch as we discuss this. Because this is crazy. I mean, I have never in all my life I mean I've seen a lot of bad epigraphy in my time. Heck, I did a review of Douglas Petrovich's book. I've seen some bad epigraphy. This is worse. This is worse. It is just... And for the viewers, both David and I, when the pictures that were available first came out, we looked at them with no preconception. Yeah. We were yeah. not looking for anything. We were not looking not to find certain things. Yeah. We were, we were, we were kind of hoping this thing would turn out. I mean... We both are firm believers yeah. that archaeology will support, yeah. will fully support a historical Bible. Yeah. Now, I'm, I'm, I, frankly, I would have really loved if they had found Yahweh on this. Would have been fabulous. Even if I discarded all the dating, 
the garbage with the dating is still would have been very, very important. So I was actually hoping this was actually going to turn out. But um, the translation, we'll just talk about the translation first. And they translate this. You are cursed by the god Yahoo. Cursed. You will die. Cursed. Cursed. You will surely die. Cursed are you, you are by Yahoo. Cursed. Um, you might want to explain for some people listening why it's the word Yahoo and how that's spelled versus the more traditional that most people are familiar with of Yahweh. Okay. Uh, it comes down to that the name, the Tetragrammaton, the holy name of God, Yahweh, can actually have more than one form. It can be abbreviated. It can be abbreviated as Yahoo. It can even be abbreviated as Yah. Just YH. So this cursed tablet would be using an abbreviated it form. It would be a abbreviated form of the divine name. I think that's important. Okay. Now, one of the things when you look at a any sort of epigraphy is you try to make sense of it. Okay? That's kind of the point. It's kind of the point. So you're looking for like in defixio tablet uh, amulets, which is this is a type of, of tablet called a defixio. Basically a lead tablet with writing on it. And writing can happen in two directions or three directions, left to right, right to left, top to bottom. And sometimes they use acrostics. An acrostic meaning that you can read it in one direction and the words are all lined up so you can read it in several, in the uh, bo a top the bottom frame as well. For that to happen, the letters have to line up. Perfectly. Perfectly. So we do find both kind of defixios, ones that are acrostics and ones that are straight, precision, neat uh, columns or lines of text. And as you told me earlier before we filmed this, I made the joke that they didn't have these lovely steel rulers with corkboard on the back that I use. And you told me they had bronze rulers to do that. So they did have rulers. Yes, they had rulers to, to create lines, to score lines. Uh, we find this, for example, I think on the uh, Ketetinon scrolls, those silver phylactery scrolls. You can actually see the line inscribed. Yeah. Now, uh, Stripling had stated earlier in his article that we didn't get into that, uh, just as background for his readers, that cursed tablets were fairly common in an age without modern medicine or psycho psychiatry. Well, here's the thing. That they might be common enough that it would be in a form, and they just filled in the name. So in that case, the person would have had a lot of time to prepare this. Well, they're, they are common in the Second Temple period. They're not common in the Bronze Age. Okay. okay. We don't find it. This would be one of the oldest, if not the oldest, defixio lead amulet that has ever been found. Okay? So that's significant there. And I think that's, I think that's a really important find just on its own. Even if we read nothing else on it, we're pretty much... Pretty much everyone agrees that this is probably a defixio. Some sort of cursed tablet, amulet. But it comes down to what it says. That's the problem. Now, what they did, their methodology was to use x-ray tom tomography to try to look through the exterior of the tablet to try to read what's on the inside. The thing with X-ray tomography is it works kind of like a CAT scan. So it's taking many layers, it's using a high intensity X-ray to pierce the lead and do it at certain energy levels so that you get this 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 sort of a stack of pancakes kind of image. And then you use put it into three dimensions. And you can peel back the layers to see what's going on. Yeah, I learned a new word reading this article. A voxel. A volume pixel. Mm-hmm. 
That's a pretty cool concept. Yeah, it is a pretty cool concept. But it is based upon that kind of CAT scan technology. So, I mean, essentially, this is just a glorified CAT scan. It's just really powerful and really focused. So it's essentially the same technology. You're still using x-rays, and you're still doing it in layers. But you're building it into a three-dimensional image, just like on a CAT scan. Exactly. Yeah. So uh, the technology has been around a long time. But this is probably the f its first use on a lead amulet. Now, here's where the problem is. The problem is that the images that are in the article, I honestly, I can't make heads or tails of it. I see no text here. I might see, I think I see two, I might be able to make out one or two letters at most. I don't make out a single word in this. And frankly, other scholars have come out and already said that they don't see any writing on this at all. Um, here's, here's a, there's a phenomenon called pareidolia. Pareidolia is when you see puppies in the clouds. I always see bunnies. You always see bunnies. Well, good. Awesome. But that's what it is. It's, it's, it's the mind filling in what it thinks it's there because it's not seeing anything. I think Gershon Galil had pareidolia when he did this epigraphy. Now, what makes me think this? First of all, scans. Scans show nothing. Scans are pretty much a blank slate. And even what could be identifiable as two letters could even be cracks in the lead. That's an issue. Huge issue. The other thing was that Galil had made a second announcement between the initial press conference for this tablet, this amulet, and uh, the publication, basically stating that uh, he had supposedly done a epigraphy of a stone block in Jerusalem which has a remarkably similar curse on this. So, if I understand what you're saying, is because he has seen something somewhere else. Mm-hmm. To use your analogy, he'd seen a puppy running around. Yeah. He then looks up into the clouds and sees a puppy up there. Yeah. He looks up in the clouds and he sees a curse inscription. He looks at a, an amulet, and he sees a curse inscription. He looks at the back side with chisel marks, and he sees a curse inscription. This is not responsible epigraphy. And frankly, Stripling nor Vanderveen have the requisite expertise to really supply their own epigraphies here. They needed Galil because of his fame. But this is terrible epigraphy. It's some of the worst I've ever seen. This, this drawing's a mess. This drawing is a mess. There's, there's no order to these characters, even if these characters existed. Nobody ever wrote like this. You know, to try to decipher um, um, you are cursed out of this by, by God Yahweh, you know, is just... And we're not even talking about, say, the paleography. Now, the paleography is the how the letters are written. You know, he's got like 12 ratios. They've identified 12 different R's and nine different Alephs. 
and four different hays. And that's like you write a four-line poem, and you write the letter A a different style every time. Yeah, exactly. You do a capital A in the middle of a word, followed by a small case A, then a cursive A, then a lowercase cursive A, and then your your favorite uh, Arial font, and then your favorite uh, Old English font, and yeah. you do each letter a different way each time. Yeah, and they can they can see this um, this chart on page seven of the article where they've got like seven letters. Seven letters written a dozen ways. Yeah. And it varies not only in, in shape, but in size. Well, radically different styles, too. I mean, you've got one letter here that's the height of four other characters. Like, who writes that way? Uh, they're claiming there's 48 letters in 14 word sets. Yeah. Which occur in three formulaic patterns. Yeah, but they're not in there. They're all over the place. They're and all over the place. I Hearing uh, Vanderveen, you know, he's basically saying, well, you've got to read top to bottom, right to left, left to right. They came up with some weird style I'd never heard about as the ox plows. They said... Like, right to left, then you go the other way, left to right, then down, then up. Yeah, it's really bizarre. Yeah, nobody writes like that. Um, because I'm not an expert, is there any other inscriptions that are written as the ox plow? I am not sure about that. Okay. Okay, I'll be very honest. I don't know if there's any... But, I know there are acrostics in... But an acrostic is a radically different it thing. It is, and it's highly organized. It's structured. It's very neat, tidy, and a yeah. pretty, pretty cool, sophisticated... This is all over the place. This is, these are random well, one of the characters things as best. I noticed, first off, at looking at this on um, page six. Mm-hmm. Is the drawing in no way matches up? Yeah, because the image on figure four is inverted. You'd have to flip that image, but even when you flip that image, and I'll po post that up there, it doesn't match. It doesn't match the the actual epigraphic drawing. It's crazy. I, I've never seen epigraphy done this way. I mean, it's bizarre. Um, and, and the actual, the rest of the article is so suppositional. I mean, there's so much conjecture in here. That's not even funny. I mean, you look at the specific letters on, say, pages 11 through to 14, and these are blurs. These are blurs. How can you make out anything from any of this? Well, and they're leaving out parts. They're leaving out lines. They, they're saying, well, yeah, this line is cutting into this letter, and we're just going to ignore that line. Yeah. And, of course, Scott Stripling said, we've been staring at these images for months. The person first reading it, first looking at the article, is going to have to take some time for his um, yeah. eyesight to get accustomed is basically what they're saying. Yeah, now, I mean, yes, there, there does take a time. You do live with an inscription before you do the epigraphy on it. And that is good practice. That is good practice. Absolutely, that is good practice. But there comes a point when you're not seeing anything at all. And if you're doing this for months, your brain will eventually fill something in. It has that to. That technical word. Pareidolia, yeah. yeah. Pareidolia. So I, I, there's, there's one other matter, I think, with the epigraphy, besides the fact there's nothing there, that is really also we need to discuss, which is the whole idea of, of epigraphic dating. 
Now, we mentioned earlier the first prong of Stripling's argument, which is to challenge the archaeological context. But this amulet was found in a fill pit. Not in C2. It was not found in C2. We don't know what strata it actually came from. So even if they're right, they could be wrong. They do try and explain that earlier in the article by saying everything around the smaller second altar that was found underneath mm -hmm. was put into just one dump site. But you can't be sure. No. And, uh, and that's the problem. It was not found in C2. And again, red flags do not mean you're saying this absolutely is not. You're saying it's questionable. Okay, so the fact, the fact it has not been found in C2 makes it questionable. The other thing is they have tried to make their epigraphy dateable. So they've tried to say that this, these, this is a writing style that predates. But what was really bizarre to me, just on a pure logical level, mm -hmm. so much of this article is dating each and every one of these letter forms. Yes. And he'll attribute this form to this bowl, this form to this manuscript, this form to this. Yeah. And yet, what they're presenting this is a cursed tablet, which would have been written by one individual. Yeah. So the idea that there's all these forms from all these different periods makes absolutely no sense just from a logical sense. Yeah. So that brings all this massive amount of data on each letter form into question right there. There yeah. should be one style of writing yeah. from one individual who existed at one point in history. Yes. And frankly, lead is not a difficult material to inscribe. You've inscribed in metal. I've inscribed in metal. In fact, I've got one of my, I've got a little loop here with my own uh, inscription on it. I don't know if you can see that, but... Does it show up on camera? Not very well. That's okay. You know, it's got my initials on there, and I just did that with a metal scriber into and steel. Steel. A steel. Much harder. Much harder. So, you know, it isn't that difficult to make clear characters in lead. And you would know what to look for in the fact that when they close the two-sided tablets, mm -hmm. there'd be some distortion. And as it's buried, there might be some more distortion. And they did say they took it and straightened it out in yeah. the imaging. Now, there is also a problem, too, with the whole matter of epigraphic dating, which is it's a very subjective thing. Right now, confidence has never been lower for the whole idea of epigraphic dating. And a lot of this is because of the recent fiasco with the Darius inscription where you had a whole bunch of experts come out and basically say that Aramaic could not have been written by anyone in modern times. I mean, you've got to admit, you do have to congratulate the professor in question that she has excellent technique. <laughs> she has excellent technique. And she was teaching her students mm -hmm. excellent technique. But it did fool all the legitimate scholars mm -hmm. because it was found what they thought was not in situ, which is what the hesitation yeah. they're saying now is, if it's not in situ, don't unconditionally endorse it. Yeah. So And again, in that, David has a video on that. You can see they were good. They immediately went back and retracted it. Yeah. But, but it left the damage. It, it is called into question now any epigraphic dating. So for them to go on the line here and basically say, oh, the epigraphy agrees with our archaeology. 
we've already disproven the archaeology. The epigraphy is, is a joke. It's a joke. And it's really unfortunate because this is going to become a laughing stock. It's reading through the article to someone who has no idea of any of this background. Yeah. It would just be overwhelming. It would be. For, for people who don't have the background material, yeah. This and would be overwhelming. No one who doesn't have this background. Yeah. I mean, I, I've actually studied Middle Egyptian under Hoffmeyer. So I have some idea of characters and how they're formed and from living with you, the history of them and evolution of characters. Yeah. But to someone who has no background, yeah, I mean, this is trying to reach the average Christian in the pews. Yeah. They would have no idea, probably, that the very fact that these are all characters written from completely different styles, shapes, for each letter, there's there's no two letters. Oh, there's no consistency. There's no epigraphic consistency. So someone in the pews wouldn't stop and just say, you know, my first take on this was like, this is supposed to be one guy writing this. Mm -hmm. I mean, I write my letters very differently than you write your letters. Mm -hmm. And when we find pieces of paper around the house, mm -hmm. we can tell. Did I write them? Did David write them? Yeah. So this is supposed to be one individual writing the whole tablet. Mm -hmm. It's very small. It's less than an inch large. Yeah. Let me also to, to sort of add more complexity to this. Let me read the note on page 22. Because the team isn't in agreement on this. I'll read this. Uh, page 22 is the second column. It's the note. Galil believes that all 48 letters are clear on the scans. I saw that. And that no brackets are needed to designate any uncertain letters. Really? Whoa! He clearly sees the letter Hey in Table 1, H3, and Figure 7, and the form and stance of the first aleph in the upper register. That's sloppiness. That's sloppy epigraphy. Although it appears partly below the letters Mame, Tov, and Vav. He al also, he is certain that the term Arur appears 12 times on the Disfixio, 6 times on Inner B, and 6 times on Outer A. And that the inner and outer texts are almost identical. In Galil's opinion, the inscription dates to the end of the 13th century BC, close to the date of the Merneptistila, circa 1208 BCE, but the other authors believe it could be older. So even though we might radically disagree with Galil's epigraphy, yes, you're saying he's still dating it. Yes. Closer to the late. Yes. He's not seeing the epigraphic dating the way Vanderveen and Stripling do. So two out of three disagree, but the person who actually did the epigraphy, the epigraphy yeah. is the one that the other two are disagreeing with. Yes. You remember back at the original conference, press conference? Yes. Stripling said everybody agreed on the dating. Everyone agreed. And Galil did the equivalent of going... <coughs> yeah, pretty much. Pretty much. You know, Galil knew that he had been thrown under the bus at that point. That Stripling had an ideological bent. And he was, he was putting everyone under the bus on that one. So, the very interesting note, and it's tucked in at the very end... Yeah, at which point most people's eyes are glazed over and you're just not reading <laughs> what's in the text anymore. Yeah, let's actually move on to the scholarship. And we're going to actually start here 
with a little bit of comic relief, which is a tweet from Douglas Petrovich. Oh my goodness. He, <laughs> he comments on this and he says, clearly the greatest lack in the Mount Ebel tablet article is the complete reference, lack of reference to my identification of Hebrew as the language of the first alphabet going back to the 19th century BC or to my article on the LMBO. Why not? This is simply not good scholarship. Disappointing. <laughs> okay. That is such a self-serving tweet. You can't take it seriously. Okay. <laughs> well, there's so much wrong with this scholarship. Yeah. To say that's the worst if thing. If that's the worst thing about this article, I can live with that. <laughs> I mean, come on. Petrovich didn't, didn't uh, talk, uh, wasn't included in this article because he's a joke. He's a joke. His so-called and... research has been thoroughly disproved. Oh, yeah. It's fringe. It's really fringe. On a more serious matter, there have been scholars that have come out already and said something about it. There's already been an article by Christopher Rolston on this. And Christopher Rolston is the leading epigrapher in the world, at least for ancient Near Eastern material. Now, has he published his own article? Because I know he's mentioned in the one from the um, Times of Israel article that we have. Yes, uh, that's, that's, that's this, his publication here. Now he does tend to go to uh, Rolston does tend to go to blogs and press first when he does these counter arguments. Okay. So this is this is very typical of Rolston. But he, he's got a CV the length of your arm. So you know he's he's not lacking for publications. So again, he is one of the people who is an expert. He is an expert on epigraphy, on epigraphy in the ancient Near East. And he especially was, Levant. He was not approached. To either do the epigraphy or review the epigraphy before publication. Oh, no. Oh, heck no. Because no, he, was, he was skeptical from the beginning. In fact, the very first two responses to that press conference was mine. Mine came out before anyone else's. And then Rolston's, like the day after. So you were both thinking along the same oh, lines. Oh, yeah, we were both thinking along the same lines. But he admits... He sees nothing in this inscription. Yeah, I actually like the way he phrased it. This article is basically a textbook case of the Rorschach text. And the authors of this article have projected upon a piece of lead the things they wanted. Yes, it's exactly what it is. In fact, I've also called it a Rorschach test. Yes. An epigraphic Rorschach test. Or a Rorschach test for epigraphers. And he also uh, says in uh, the same article... Facts are facts, and this article is very short on facts, and very long on boundless speculation. And even Barillon University's uh, professor Aaron Mayer comments on this, quote, I don't accept all the interpretations that were suggested in the article, and I plan to punish, publish a different opinion in, the academic, in an academic journal, end quote. So, you know, this is, this is really a gaudy piece of scholarship. The, the scholarship misquotes its sources. Its, its epigraphy is crazy. I mean, even the acknowledgments at the end, you know, convey a certain bias of the authors. And I don't know if you've looked at those, but again, uh, it's a really small print on page 22. Acknowledgments. Stripling, the ex expedition director, expresses appreciation to all team members. Notably among them are the following. Abigail Levitt, assistant director. Stephen Rudd, engineer. Frankie Schneider. And just goes on with a who's who of ABR. I see Michael Benron, Baron there. That is one of Vanderveen's disciples. Which is not... Who is also a role maximalist. Which again, if they're working on the site, mm -hmm. that's... Not untypical that it would be from one group. But it would that you wouldn't want to have that you wouldn't, you wouldn't want to have that circular referencing. Yes, but you wouldn't want that in your article. No. When no. you're going to 
public press. It's, it's uh, as, as you said, it's not uncommon for one group to do the initial digging and at least and preliminary research. Come up with the conference paper. Yeah, sure. But then there's that idea, peers before publishing. Yeah. The Times of Israel mentions that, peers before publishing. Yeah. That you run this through, if it's this big of a find. Yeah. You run it through your worst enemy, your best friend, yeah. the experts, the people you don't know who are experts in the field. The guys who are going to be honest with you. Exactly. Yeah. The guys who are going to be honest with you. And they're going to critique it. They're going to say, you know, sometimes when you're lucky and you do good work, they say, well, you know, you make a good argument, but I'm not convinced. Yeah. There are times they say, it just isn't there. Nobody else sees it. This is going to be fodder for atheist mocking. It really is. And we won't be able to disagree with them. No, we won't be able to disagree with them because it's, it's bad. It's a hot mess. And it's going to hurt the credibility of archaeology that actually does support the Bible. Yes, it will. Just like that last tablet that was found not in situ, but it was so well done. Mm -hmm. All the experts, various universities all over the world, yeah. got so excited about it. Yeah. And the professor had to come and kind of go, uh, guys, that was a teaching example I did for my students. I left it there. Oops. Yeah. yeah. You don't go public. No. Before a certain level of credibility has been established. Yes, and they went very public very because soon. The idea was not to be academically credible and then yeah. inform the public. It was to get donors and the, the person sitting in the pew excited about something yeah. that by all looks of it, simply is not true. Yeah. Now, again, we want to emphasize, I still think that this is a curse tablet. I don't think there's any reason to doubt it's a curse tablet, given it's, it's a lead, lead amulet, and it's structured. It does, we, I mean, that would make a lot of sense if it was a defixio. So if you take out all the dating and the preconceptions, if we take out all the preconceptions and the dating uh, issues, what we have left is a lead tablet, or lead, sorry, a lead amulet that was found on Mount Ebal, the mountain of cursing. An occultic site that dates to the late bronze, early Iron Age one. So it could still be... It's still a valuable find. It still could be... The mountain of cursing. Yeah, so it could be the mountain of cursing. The problem is, by doing this irresponsible scholarship, they've now turned what could was a legitimate find, an important find, into a laughingstock. And people are going to continue to quote this article. On both sides. On both sides. Th this is another thing that's just going to divide the church. Yeah. Because credible scholars are already questioning this. And then the person in the pew is going to say, oh, you're just not a Christian. Yeah. Scholars. Yeah, exactly. And so it's denigrating scholarship. Yeah. This thing's going to, this thing's going to haunt us for a long time. So I'm going to wrap it up here. So there you have it. Our Mana Machine uh, alert uh, for this article, which is, again... You are cursed by the god Yahoo, an early Hebrew inscription from Mount Ebel, by Scott Stripling, Gershon Galil, Ivana Kompova, Yaroslav Valich, Peter Gert Vanderveen, and Daniel Bavik. Okay. So. And where can that be found? Uh, that is available on, we will put the link in the description for the article. So you can go look it up yourselves. It's an open source, open access article published in Heritage Science. Oh boy, this one was a doozy. This one was bad. This one was really bad. I mean, it had 
bad archaeology, it had bad epigraphy, it had bad scholarship, and the clowns came out on this in this circus. So, uh, with that said, uh, I want to thank you very much for watching. I hope you learned something today, and I hope you found this interesting. And we'll see you next time on Ancient Egypt and the Bible. Thank you for watching.